Today is May 12th, 2020. My guest is economist and Nobel laureate Paul Romer, university professor of economics at New York University. He previously served as the chief economist at the World Bank and is the founding director of NYU's Marin Institute of Urban Management. This is Paul's fifth appearance on Econ Talk, having last been here in April of 2019, talking about growth, cities, and the state of economics. Our topic for today is the COVID-19 pandemic and where we stand in mid-May 2020. And as I've done recently, I want to remind listeners that because of the pandemic, we're doing some different stuff with audio. We're also trying to record this as a YouTube video for those who want to watch it. Paul, welcome back to Econ Talk. Yeah, it's good to be back. So am I the am I in the like the top and the return visits or no. are the people who meet me? Okay. I got no, you're trying. like you're like Henry Aaron's brother Tommy. Uh, <laughs> you know, the two of them I think hold the record for most home runs by a, uh two brothers in the major leagues. Okay. Uh, I think Tommy he had he might have under fifty, he might have under ten. I can't remember, but you get the joke. Right. Um Anyway, as we as we record this, uh, it's mid May, as I mentioned, and we're uh, there are about eighty thousand dead in America, as far as we know. There's a lot of uncertainty about that number, but that's the current sort of best guess uh, due to the COVID nineteen. And unemployment is just under fifteen percent, but people expect it to go dramatically higher. Uh, what do you think it's important to recognize at this stage of the pandemic? What have we What have we learned? Yeah. Um. I think that it's important to recognize that um, things have, we've suffered a very serious shock. When this virus jumped over the barrier and um, started spreading amongst humans, we just lost a permanent large fraction of our opportunities. I, I think it's it's hard to, to appreciate that something like this could happen for, for reasons that are completely out of our control. And it's even worse when we think, oh, you know, if we had done something, we might have prevented this from becoming so bad. But the bygones are bygones, and we've suffered a big loss, a big shock. And I think we need to get past denial on this and come to terms with what are the best of some bad out, out, outcomes or all, uh, bad alternatives. But the, frankly, the alternatives facing us right now are, are very grim. Why do you say that? I mean, in particular, uh, there, there's a lot of worry about a quote second wave. There's a lot of worry about that a vaccine may not be forthcoming, period, or it might yeah. be months away. Uh, you've suggested that we are still at a risk of massively larger numbers of deaths. I'm I'm a little bit skeptical about that, but lay out your pessimistic case. Well, I think. Um the, the, the way this played out was that there was some consensus about an emergency uh, response, which was lockdown. That made sense amongst people who believe in uh, basically what they call mitigation, which is you accept that you cannot stop this virus from spreading through the population. You try and keep it from spreading too quickly so you, so you don't overwhelm your hospitals. Right. But you just accept that it's going to spread through the population and some people will die from it. The other strategy is suppression, that you take active measures that will keep the number of people infected to a small enough number and keep pushing that number down so that uh, you don't spread through the whole, the whole population. The, the disadvantage of suppression is you have to stay with it. There's never a time when you can stop because when you stop, you go right back to exponential growth like we had in the beginning and it zooms through the, through the whole population. And, and what we're learning right now is that the strategies we're using for suppression are very, very costly. We're, we're losing something like, you know, like I'm estimating 500 billion a month in foregone output. You go back to the, to the so you think, okay, well, if that's the only alternative, maybe we should go with um, so mitigation, but spread throughout the whole population. The, the thing I think people aren't recognizing about that path is that one's very slow. It takes more than a year to have this virus spread all the way through the population if you're, if you're mitigating so we don't overwhelm our, our hospitals. So, uh, you know, it like roughly speaking, if this virus spreads through the whole population, probably about a million people will die. 
Um, and that's using a, a half a percent as the infection death rate, which is, a, you know, the, kind of at the lower end of what we believed before. Um, to, if you're going to limit deaths to 2,000 people a day, then it, it takes like 400 days or, or um, 500 days to, to get to a million deaths. So it could be 500 days until we get past the point where people are dying, we get to herd immunity, and we're, we're past this crisis. So both the, the mitigation strategy where we let it spread or the suppression strategy right now look like they impose enormous costs on, uh, on, on society. And you know, arguing between the two of them seems to me to be almost kind of irrelevant because they're both so awful. What we need to do is figure out something which is sustainable but a lot less costly. So let me push back against the million deaths because I really yeah. think that's I don't agree with that. I okay. thought that that was what I thought in the early days. It was certainly the, I would call that the consensus. And uh -huh. I interviewed Tyler Cowen on this program. I don't even remember when it was. I think it was sometime in the Middle Ages, uh, but I, it was probably a month ago uh, at the very beginning. And in the very, very beginning of this, uh, you know, Tyler, I could sense, it's an interesting, I, was, I, I sensed in our conversation, he was very careful not to be optimistic in any dimension. And I think part of that he felt was like a social service that, that we had to make sure that people were worried. And I came very close to asking him to whether he thought a million people would die or not. Uh, what was the over under? Would he take the over or the under meaning? Do you think there'd be more than a hundred than a million deaths or fewer? Yeah. And I, I could sense he didn't want to talk about that. So I didn't ask it, but that was the number that was on my mind that, that it might be a million people dead. And that number was based on, you know, roughly 50% of the population getting it mm -hmm. and uh, a death rate of 1%. And you've done, the, you've done the same thing. You've said, well, actually, 100% is going to get it and the death rate is going to be no, half no, a percent. No, no. To, to be clear, I was assuming 60% uh, infected and a half a percent okay. is the, um, uh, the infection death rate. Yeah. So. The reason I think that's gro grossly an over, a gross overestimate, and I'm, I, yeah. I bring this up out of intellectual curiosity more than yeah. policy purposes, yeah. and I think for educational reasons, I think it's important to talk about it. I don't, I because do, I don't. By the, so, just to be clear, I'm not saying that. Well, if it's only 250,000, it's great. It's obviously a horrible tragedy, oh. regardless. Yeah. Um, the overwhelming numbers of deaths right now in the United States are. are there's, there's two things that jump out to me. Uh, about half are in the New York metropolitan area. They're in New York, Connecticut, New Jersey. Yep. Uh, 60 to 70 percent are people over the age of 70. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, an enormous number of, of Exponent, amount of the exponential growth appears to have occurred from a handful, relatively small, at least not a handful, but a relatively small number of people who infected large numbers of people in social gatherings like right. parties, celebrations, yep. uh, conferences, and uh, choirs and religious services. So it seems to me that if, if, we, if we did nothing dramatic, and we're going to mention a little bit, you and I are going to talk about some dramatic things we could do or could have done, yep. Yep. but if we did nothing dramatic, and we told people, wear masks. If you're the age, over the age of 70, st stay in self-isolation, the equivalent of quarantine. Mm -hmm. And don't do anything with more than 25 people. Don't hold religious services. Do not hold concerts, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Uh, I don't understand how we're going to get anything close to a death rate of a half a percent. In fact, you know, in New York City right now, the – my understanding is the best guess is 20 to 25 percent of the people in New York City have had the vax have had the virus. Yeah, and yep. and the death rate isn't is it half a percent in New York among the well that's that's where I got the half a percent from. Yes, yeah, is, is from New York. But um, but, but let me say I think you and I don't disagree on the, the facts here. It's really just a matter of how we break these down into cases. So what I was saying is that if we want to get to this point where we have herd immunity. So the, the virus just dies out because it has trouble get, finding people to infect. Get, yeah. To get to herd immunity, you have to get to at least 60% infected. And then if the death rate is a, is a half a percent, that cause, leads to a, a, a million deaths. So but again, the point, if, 
but but that's 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 if we want to get to herd immunity. Now, what I think what you're articulating is a suppression strategy. There's a way we can keep this from spreading to everybody, and it's a suppression strategy which is less costly than say locking everybody down the way we're we're doing right now. And, and the reason I'm the reason I'm saying that have to go. Yeah. the reason I'm saying that, Paul, is I don't think the the half percent number is an average. It's actually yeah. a, a tenth of a percent or less for people under the age of 25 or 40 even maybe. And it's five to 20 percent horrifically for people over the age of 70 and maybe 60. Yep. And and so we could bring that number down with some that that uh, infection fatality rate, the yeah. so-called IFR, we could bring that number down well below point f- half of a percent yep. if, if, if elderly people were more, if we did some, if elderly people were more yep. careful which yep. they will be, <laughs> yep. trust me, I'm 65, I'm going to be more careful. And if yep. we treated nursing homes very differently than we did tragically in the yep. first few weeks of the crisis, which were... So, yeah, so again, I, I think we're not disagreeing, but let me be clear what I'm trying to say. There is a vision, which is a, a time in the future where we don't have to do anything differently. We go back to life as of 2019 that you could get to because of herd immunity. Oh, yeah. And that is logically possible, I'm just saying it, it, it means a lot of infections, a lot of deaths, and crucially, it takes a long time. So when people are saying, we want to get back quickly to 2019, going for her, her, herd immunity doesn't get us back quickly. Now, where you're going is where I think we should go, is say, we can't just like lock everybody down, just say everybody's got to stay home. And we can't do that indefinitely because it's way too costly, but there may indeed be a series of measures which we have to stick with forever, or at least until there's a vaccine that's you know widely deployed. But um, there's a series of measures that could be a lot less costly than just locking everybody down, but that suppress the uh, suppress the the virus. So I think we're on the same page. And then the conversation is about what are those measures that will actually, at moderate cost, make a difference, suppress the, the the virus. And keep in mind that that we have to be willing to stick with those forever. I just want to add one more caveat to the discussion about uh, the costs of the current so-called shutdown, lockdown, or whatever you want to call it. Actually, I think it's important not to call it a lockdown. It's not a lockdown. It's a government-imposed shutdown, much of which happened before the government imposed it voluntarily. Yeah. Uh, and as you have correctly pointed out, and I've tried to push – it, it is a point at which it has nothing to do with the government. People are just afraid. They don't want to eat out. They don't want to get on an airplane if they can avoid it. They don't want to go to a hotel. It's an enormous part of the economy that's not going to be fixed where the government just said, okay, go back. You know, it, it, this is, there's a lot of dimensions to this. But I want to talk about your uh, back of the envelope calculation, of uh, which you made earlier, of uh, $500 billion, uh, a month. Um, there are costs that are government spending costs that are burdens on the fisc, so to speak. They're fiscal mm-hmm. costs of government paying out money that'll have to eventually be funded by, that are being funded by debt, eventually have to be paid back in some dimension via taxes. Uh, mm-hmm. That is risky because there's uncertainty about at some point whether that is sustainable. But there are other costs, which are, I think, what you're mainly referring to, which is the reduction in economic activity, the lost GDP from the fact that people are doing uh, sheltering at home, many of whom cannot work, many of whom have no demand for their services. Mm -hmm. There's a third cost, which is not measured, which is unmeasurable, which I know you're also worried about. I think it's important to make sure it's heard and put on the table, which is the loss of dignity, the fear of of the future, the inability to plan, the mental uh, burden on people of anxiety and depression, potentially suicide, uh, and worse, potentially, tragically, as you have pointed out also, the political consequences of this, when people are voting for the in the next, not this election, which is already, you can debate how pleasant or unpleasant it is, but the 2024 election is the one I'm really thinking about, which is yeah. Yeah. the potential for demagogue yeah. uh, candidates, demagogue, demagogic candidates to mobilize people who correctly, correctly believe they were betrayed in this response to the pandemic. And as you said earlier, I don't blame there are people to blame. It's really complicated. I think there's some yeah. easy people to blame, some of which is yeah. merit, merited, but a lot of it, it's more complicated. And yeah. and yet the political process nuances and it's strong suit. So I think it's really important to get that point out on the table that the costs of this are 
uh, potentially much more than 500 billion. And that the current situation, which is this sort of open-ended yeah. uh, mix of government mandate and uh, individual fear mm -hmm. or return and then worse fear because it, it grows again yeah. is uh, really to be avoided as much as possible, if, if it's any way possible. Yeah, yeah. Yep. No, you're, you're exactly right. My, my 500 billion tried to capture that just the things we're not producing right now, the restaurant meals that aren't produced, the yeah, yeah. dental services not provided, and then a little allowance for the fact that um, a lot of the, the supply chains, the connections, the jobs, the positions are going to go away. So the longer we stay in a, this depressed state, the lower our future ability to produce output uh, will, will be as well. I didn't try and put a number on the, the political risk, but that's yeah. the one that dominates this decision for me because if somebody said to me, we have to just stay where we are in the economic, you know, kind of uh, phrase, we have to stay with this as long as it takes to get a vaccine. And that might take five or 10 years. My answer, my response to them is, well, if this means the, 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 a threat that could really undermine our whole democratic system and our whole rule of law, I don't think it's worth running that, that risk. We got to find something else that doesn't threaten to destroy everything about the foundations of our society. Yeah, I, I made that observation to someone recently and they, they looked at me like I was a lunatic, like I was some cuckoo. Yeah. Yet I, I, this actually is someone who I think does know something about the Weimar Republic, for example, or mm -hmm. other situations where really a breakdown, fundamental breakdown in, in civilization occurs. Uh, opening the door to many, many, many unpleasant things. And, yeah. and I, th the other thing I point I want to make, which drives me crazy, is that uh, I don't know about you, but I suspect it's the same. My hardship in this ordeal is that I have to share my broad, you know, my bandwidth with two kids home from college and my wife teaching on Zoom during the day to her high school calculus students. Right. My income is secure. I have plenty of everything. Uh, I, there are a lot of things I miss, <laughs> but I'm not enduring any, quote, hardship. It's just, it's frustrating, annoying. It's a little bit of an emotional challenge at times. A lot of wonderful things. I'm playing a lot of chess with my kids and yeah. they're playing Puerto Rico and, and really getting good at it. Yeah. But there's an enormous part of the population. That, and I work, by the way, I work from home already yeah. with econ talk and writing and other things. So, so there's so there's tens of millions of people who can't pay their mortgage and they're getting a $1,200 check. I mean, that's, right. if they're lucky. Now, there are some people in unemployment, they're doing well, they're small businesses, they're getting loans. It's, it's slowly starting to to work a little bit. But I, I think a lot of the chattering class, the pundit class underestimates the, the human side of this that's yeah. devastating yeah. for people not like them. Yeah, and I, I haven't gone back and reread this carefully, but you know, my recollection is there were, there were developments like, you know, the Wobblies, the workers of the world who were kind of yeah. more on the left and then Huey Long and, you know, even the United States, you could see incipient signs of this rebellion against the, the current system, this sense that we had to just tear everything down because it's so, so broken. And um, that's just incredibly dangerous when a society gets to that point. Oh, yeah, uh, I totally agree. So let's let's talk about what you've been writing a lot about, uh, which I'm extremely interested in. And uh, I'm agnostic on it. I don't understand the strong case for it, but I'm eager to hear from you, yeah. which is the potential for testing. Yeah. So uh, I, just to throw into the mix, I, there was a, a tweet this morning um, from somebody who's living in um, – in living an American, living in, I think an American, living in Wuhan. Yeah. And he said, you know, Wuhan wasn't a shutdown. It was a lockdown. <laughs> it was uh, martial law, barbed wire, guards in front of every apartment complex. You could only go out with a pass. Um, if you were positive, you were sent into a, and this is also true in South Korea, you're sent into a quarantine dormitory. Right. Uh, you had to wear an ankle bracelet. Uh, I think in South Korea and and be followed and and tracked. These options aren't really available in America. Yeah. Uh, so when you talk about so in an authoritarian state, uh, which China is more or less, mm -hmm. or a um, a different culture, maybe a, a more homogeneous country like South Korea or Israel, which also had very strong lock close to lockdown situations that people accepted. The testing and, tr and tracing idea I don't fully understand. So 
tell me what you see as the role that testing would play in yeah. uh, getting us out of this sure. or getting, making it, moving us forward. Well, um, the first thing I have been saying recently to people is that if the, if the Paul Romer of, of May 2020 talked to the Paul Romer of 2019 and said to the Paul Romer of 2019, we got to spend $100 billion a year on tests, um, get everybody tested every 14 days. In the case Romer, there's a pandemic. <laughs> well, I mean, the Paul Romer of 2019 would not have bought this argument. I, you know, I just, it, it, it just, it, it, things are not that bad. It's not that serious. Why do you got to go all this trouble, all this problem? And, and the difference is that now, in the face of this particular uh, crisis, uh, I've just realized that the, the alternatives of letting the virus spread through the whole population or trying to suppress it um, indefinitely through other means are both so unattractive that now, you know, 100 billion a year, which seemed like way too much before, now it seems kind of like a walk in the park. So that's a, the first thing. Now, the second thing is there's reasonable people can differ about what's the right low cost way to suppress this virus indefinitely. And, and by the way, how are we gonna suppress the next few viruses that, that come down the pike? Things like wearing masks, if we have a social consensus and can sustain that indefinitely, you know, that, that could go a long way towards uh, you know, protecting us and suppressing this, this, this virus. But the idea with testing though, is, is that if there's some information we don't have, what we'd like to know is who's infectious right now if we knew that information, what we could do is say, we're going to isolate those people for a, you know, a short period of time, a, a few weeks, and we can then suppress the, the virus without interfering with anybody else's daily lives. Now, now, how you work the deal where when you find somebody who's infectious, you get them to go into quarantine, we don't have to use a China solution for that. Steve Levitt and I wrote, a, we can pay people to go into quarantine when they test positive. So we got other tools that can yeah. be consistent with freedom on, on this. But right now what we're missing is the information. Now, one way that people have proposed to get that information, and the only thing that was available in the past was this idea of contact tracing. When you find somebody who's infected, you trace back their contacts and you try and essentially test them to see um, which of the contacts are also infectious. That was the cheapest way to figure out who is infectious in the past because we didn't have tests. What's happened is the cost of tests have been coming down radically and are still going down. So my claim is it's actually going to be cheaper and more effective and more efficient for us to just scale up the testing and do it uh, for everybody. And it's partly colored by our experience, which was the contact tracing system was the system we were using in January when this virus exploded and it just completely failed. The people who say, okay, well, contact tracing is gonna work, get it, give us a do-over. I don't see the evidence that it's gonna be different uh, if, we, if we do it again. So I think we need, given the low cost of testing now, relatively, I think we need to just invest in that, that capacity for testing. And then with this information, who's infectious right now, we've got a lot more options for managing this at, at low cost. So let's just give us an overview of what you see as the state of testing right now. Right now here in Maryland where I live, uh, I think it takes, uh, it's still a swab up your nose, which everyone yep. says is really unpleasant, not yep. something people are eager to do. Yep. And it's, I think, a three-day wait. Uh, and there are yep. two problems with that, obviously. One is it's just a long time. Second yep. is in between those three days, you could go get infected again. Yep. <laughs> But you could come back negative and then get infected in the three days you're waiting and dangerously yeah. affect people. So where are we on the testing? Well, there's, um, there's two types of tests. And, you know, I don't find the terminology very helpful here, so I won't, I won't use it like antibody right. versus antigen. One test just asks, are there signs of your body's response to an infection, which tells us you were infected at some point in the past? Okay. So has your body responded to an infection? That's one class of tests. The other class of tests are, is there virus present in your body right now? Yep. And so the swabs, you know, the PCR, but there's some other versions of that kind of antigen testing. Test for the virus, not your body's reaction to that. The antigen testing is the thing that can identify you early in the process of being infectious. And even when you're best, asymptomatic. 
Yep. And it has the best shot at catching you when you don't have symptoms, but you're infectious and infecting other people. So right now that's mainly PCR, although there's one other antigen test that's just been introduced. Explain what PCR is. Well, PCR is a way to take a sample and then to amplify the, the to try and amplify a particular string, string of, of RNA from the virus. So if there's a little bit of that RNA in the sample, this amplifies it up to the point where it's easy to measure and it says, oh, yep, there was RNA from the virus in, in this sample. So PCR is a, is a, is a way to do that. Um, antigen tests are another way to see, oh, yeah, there was a, a string of that, that RNA from the virus in, in the sample. Um, the, one of the big holdups, as you described, is, is that the, the approved tests require these swabs that you know, go way up the nose towards the back of your throat, and they were in short supply. Now, now here we get to the heart of why we haven't expanded testing more rapidly. There are university researchers who said, we don't need swabs. We can actually just test it in test saliva. So there's a, there's a group at Rutgers <laughs> that showed you can just test, you just have people spit in a tube and you test the saliva. Another group at Yale that said, you know, actually, you know, the saliva samples are actually even better than, than using the, the nasal pharyngeal swabs. Fewer so, false positives and false negatives, presumably. Yeah. Now, now, slightly better, not hugely better, but uh, like way more convenient. And, you know, there's no shortage of swabs. So why hasn't everybody started uh, switching to, uh, to the saliva tests? Well, even under the expedited process of giving emergency use authorizations, EUA, at the FDA, the FDA said to the group at, at Rutgers, okay, you can test saliva samples, but only with this particular kit for collecting the, the, this particular type of tube that people spit in, and only your lab. We're not approving anybody else to do what you just discovered how to do. And then even worse, they said, and only if a person spits into a tube in, under the supervision of a healthcare professional. And then it's like, okay, well, I mean, can we do telemedicine? Can they spit in the tube, but you watch them? No, it has to be in the physical presence of a healthcare professional to spit in the tube. Now, why they mandated that, I have no idea. After four weeks, they finally said, okay, they let you do the, the swabs at home without supervision, so we'll let you spit in a tube now without supervision, but it's still the case that the only lab that can process those samples is at Rutgers. And if anybody else wants to be a good citizen at some university campus and start doing this, you just have to come ask us and we'll take several weeks and we'll yeah. you know, decide whether we're, we're going to let you. And we will never get to the level of testing we need if we operate under that kind of uh, regime under, under the FDA. So that has got to change. Okay, so I hate to defend the FDA in this, in this situation. Well, but, I hate to attack them, but... <laughs> yeah, well, you and I are a little bit different, but, but I think the... Just 180 degrees, but, but I, think the, I think the issue ultimately might be uh, if proving that you're negative is uh, valuable, yeah. that people could obviously um, yeah. fake and, and use other people's spit and all that. So the presence that of a healthcare was, professional, I kind of get. Yeah, but, that was, I think I was told it was like chain of custody. Yeah, um, there you go. Was, okay, I can understand that a little bit. That's that's not the FDA's problem here. And I mean, they, the somebody least, else should be worried about that problem. Not agreed. I, I agree with you there. And yeah. but let, let's let me ask you this: um, with the saliva tests that you know of, and you know of two, and maybe there's uh, there are others. Uh, one. I, what I think is, it's actually, I think it's just one, but you can now do it at home. That's just what changed. Um, but yeah, I think you said at Rutgers and at Yale. Oh, no, Yale used the Rutgers. Uh, oh. Yale got, did the test of the Rutgers system. Okay. Yeah. So, so, but there is a saliva test. So the question is, one, how, how much does it cost? And by cost, of course, we need, mean yeah. administer and evaluate, not just administer. Yeah. And then secondly, how long does it take? Yeah. Um, my understanding, there's a logistics challenge. You're like, how do you get the sample to the lab? I think the lab can do it in about four hours. But, but other people I've talked to in the labs say that this is something that could be like dramatically scaled up. Both the throughput, how many samples can we test, you know, start down the line? And then how long does it take to go down the line? There's a little bit of a trade-off between throughput and, you know, the, the waiting time. But uh, the people in the lab say they think that this, both of these could be speeded up quite quite substantially. So if I may, we could call it, uh, I'm going to call it 
sorry about this, Paul. I'm going to call it Jiffy Tube. So with Jiffy Tube, you you, you show up to a uh, a freestanding kiosk or uh, a storefront. Mm-hmm. You spit in the cup, and then you wait in the, in the room with the magazines and the TV playing a really bad yeah. uh, cable uh, reality show, which is what my Jiffy Lube looks like. Right. And you stay isolated for those four hours. It's not fun, but you work this broadband and you again i i think we you know we can sort out all of those issues if we move as fast as we can to speed up the the testing both more throughput and shorter shorter waiting times and you know for example if there if there's a wait time people can always get their results over you know over the internet but i like this idea of that while you're waiting for the test you can't go get reinfected by someone else at least for now so yeah, the way yeah, but the way this works is that if you're testing frequently, you just accept even the test is going to miss some people who are That's true. Um, who are truly positive, and you might get uh, you know False. say reinfected before before you you know um you might be infected you know even as soon as you get a negative result you still might get reinfected so the, that's why you have to retest uh, frequently the the the, king, the key is that this is not going to like wipe out the virus but it means that the number of people who are infected will be steadily decreasing over time. This R0 number is less than one, so you get a steady decrease, and that's really all we can hope for. R0 being the the number of people that one person infects. Uh, so the super spreader could have an R0 of 50. You show up at a party with it, and you kiss and hug a lot of people, and 50 yeah. people end up contagious, but this would that person would be Move, removed from the party uh, effectively, which wouldn't show up at the party to start with, yeah. and the R0 w- would fall. So yeah. let's, um, you're suggesting that testing could become the equivalent of, um, you know, stop stopping off to gas up your car. It's a, just something you do every once in a while to make yeah. sure you're not endangering other people, that you're yeah. not at risk yourself. So um, why is that going to make such a big difference? Why is that a game changer yeah. for how we move forward economically and inter- when I say economically again I don't like yeah. that word our ability to interact with one another in every way that we used to do in January of 2019 of 2020 well, well whether you're trying to use just population testing or whether you're trying to use testing plus tracing um, the goal here is to figure out who's infectious because the only way to stop or suppress this virus is to find a large enough fraction of the people who are infectious get them isolated so they don't infect more people. And then you're on this path where the number of people infected is falling over time. So you just have to find enough of the people who are currently infectious and get them, get them isolated. If you do that, you don't have to interfere with the activities of anybody who's not infectious. So a lot of the value of the test is, you know, as you were just alluding to, is that when you get a negative test result, like if I got a negative test result and my dentist had a negative test result in the last couple of days, I could go to the dentist and have him check check my teeth and he'd be safe and I'd be safe. Yeah, I guess the, um, I can see it being a very powerful reducer of R0 and death if uh, we made all, I don't like, I shouldn't have said we made all. If nursing homes chose yeah. or sporting, sport sports teams chose yeah. to use these tests frequently. They were cheap enough, quick enough, and that would allow, again, you could, in theory, you could be tested before the game. You yeah. could show up at the game as a fan. Oh, yeah. uh, you could, there could be a, a tailgate party for people waiting for their results. Yeah. The ones who were positive would be told they have to go home. They wouldn't be allowed in. There'd be a lot of different yeah. ways that, that a test that was cheap, quick, and uh, relatively painless could make life better. Uh, but I'm wondering about the, uh, I, I'll call it the civil liberties issue. Yeah. Uh, would you require people with a positive test to go home? Would you pay yeah. them to go home, as you alluded to a, a little bit ago? Uh, would you force them to wear an ankle bracelet or how, install an app on their phone that would allow people to monitor whether they're keeping the, you know, quarantined? So the, so the basic answer is, that I want to give to this is that, Until we have the capacity to test and get this valuable information, it's it's premature to to worry too much about what we do with that information. Fair enough. But but I do agree that we want to use that information in ways that protect liberty and protect our freedom and don't uh, 
encumber us uh, too, too much. I think there are ways to do that. This is part of why I'm very suspicious of the digital contact tracing. I just don't see how you do that without further eroding notions about you know, privacy and without further entrenching the power of a few, just a couple of very powerful firms right now. Yeah. They have been in discussions where people are saying, well, you know, it's just a new world is we're going to have to force everybody to carry a cell phone when they're out on the street. With that app on it installed, and yeah, that'll listen, beep. That'll beep if they fail to test, so everyone will I, know. I don't want to. I don't want to live in a world where we're forcing a couple of firms. Uh, we're forcing everybody to carry and use the product of a couple of firms. So, um, we're on the same so page. I, I'm not happy about that that outcome. Now, on the um, on the uh, the other kind of test results, I, I have some co-authors on a paper who are from Scandinavia. Their attitude was that there could be a version of this testing that you do at home. Um, is it's really the progress is so fast that very soon you'll be able to do a version of the, the molecular PCR-like test at, at home. Like a pregnancy like, test, a strip. Yeah, or well, a, like a pregnancy test or a, 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 the, the molecular tests involve putting things in a little vat and letting a little pot and keeping it warm for a little while. But, you know, mm -hmm. we, could, we could manage that. It's like simpler than a bread maker. Um, but their attitude was, Give people the ability to find out whether they're infectious and then just trust them to do the right thing. And Knowing you know, that some of them won't, that's okay. Yeah. It's better than yeah. so <laughs> nothing. It was, kind of, it was sort of like these, these Scandinavians were instructing me, the, you know, the, the guy from the U.S., the, the home of freedom, about, you know, actually, if you just let people know information, they generally will do things and it, it turns out okay. Yeah, so, we understand that, that not everybody will, but that's yeah. not the – there is no solution short of, you know, full martial law, which yeah. I think most of us don't want, that is going to eradicate, fully suppress this. And by the way, of course, as we're recording this today in Wuhan, it was announced they have a few new cases. So they have, yeah. a few, it's not clear how well some people have done and with other techniques and but, et cetera. But so well, the, what the, can, the, modest, the modest version of this is just make it possible for everybody to know if they're infectious. And most people aren't going to want to infect their colleagues. They aren't going to want to infect their, their grandmother. They'll, they'll take uh, heightened precautions. Um, so I, I think that's the, the, the simplest way to do it. The next step up would be to say, well, there's certain things where, you know, like counterparties might not agree to do things with you unless you can show you've got a test result. Like my dentist may not want to see me because it isn't going to work for me to wear a mask when I'm in the dental chair. So, you know, my dentist may not want to see me unless I get a test. And that's his choice. I don't think you need the government to, to, to force that. Um, you could even say, you know, as part of like our security screening stuff at the airport, you've got to have either a recent test or take a test at the airport to fly in an airplane. So that could involve a little bit more uh, coercion. But there's lots of incremental steps we can use, uh, take to use this information that could save a lot of lives and also bring back the economy. Like one of the things I would do if we could just get a little bit more testing online, you know, from one of these university labs, just get them free of the FDA, get them so they can produce, you know, like 20, 50,000 tests a day. Just have them test everybody involved in baseball and restart the baseball season. Yeah. You know, maybe don't bring fans into the stands yet, but you could televise games in a stadium. You could test all the players, all of the coaches, the umpires, yeah. any of the service uh, workers who, who support them. So you could easily start televised baseball games without any risk that we're going to cause a big spreading event that um, uh, kills other people and makes the, the virus spread faster. Yeah, when you, we, took, we were talking earlier a minute ago about people doing the right thing. Of course, when your livelihood's at stake, I think it's tempting to take a chance on hurting other people when it's otherwise costly to you. So yeah. we could, as you said before, it might be worthwhile to – pay people not to work in certain settings once they got a positive right. test and if they can't work from home, et cetera, et cetera. And it's really important to remind people that there are a lot of people who are going to get a positive test who have zero symptoms, have nothing wrong with it. We, we do not know yet the right. full long-term consequences, but most young people who get this, nothing happens to them. They don't even know they have it. Right. Um, now, again, we don't know the long-term effects, et, right. et cetera, but, but I think that, that has to stay but, front and center. But, but so. I, but I think it's good to emphasize, too, that this is one of these areas where there's big kind of like community or social effects, not just individual effects. Yep. So Major League Baseball might actually say, you to play, you have to get tested. 
And if you test positive, we're not going to let you play because this is part of how we protect the reputation of the entire league. Yeah. Because otherwise, you know, people come shut us down or something. So, yeah. you know, at various scales, we may have to require people and say, look, if you're not okay with these rules, it's fine. Just take the, take the season off, come back next year, and maybe we won't have to require the testing next year. Yeah. So what do you see as um, – I, I see there being uh, – a number of groups here that are desperately um, working to do something. So let me list them. There are people like you, and a little bit like me, but more you than me, uh, who are freelancing, trying to spread the word, trying to get ideas out there. There's government, which is very slow, very laborious, very rule-oriented, struggling to respond with any urgency, as is tragically the healthcare system, the medical supply chains. We've exposed a lot of I think tragic bureaucratic uh, problems with the medical supply chain, and we're going to. Although, can I can yeah. I just um, uh, break character and say something nice about government? Yeah, uh, the Congress did allocate twenty five billion for for testing. It's a small part of a much bigger, more complicated response, but but there's been a little bit of positive motion. So but, yeah, that's good. Yeah. But so government does some things. Time it takes a while for it to. Sp- I don't know if any of that money's been spent yet. I doubt it, but. It will eventually. Uh, so we got government, we got individuals like you and me trying to spread the word about what we think is the right thing to do or, or trying to spread information, which is very valuable. Then we have uh, foundations like Gates and others, large, yeah. s- still bureaucratic, but in a different way, uh, but with large sums of money available and who I think are working very hard to try to do something. And then finally, we have people in, I'll call them Silicon Valley. They're not obviously all in Silicon Valley. But talented, creative people who are racing, working around the clock right now, trying to find a vaccine, trying to find, a, you know, all kinds of yep. uh, things are happening that I think will, will lead to some wonderful things down the road, yep. even when some of them will fail. But we're, we're going to learn a lot. There's really a, what I would call a full court press yep. among skilled people here. And so the question is, there's a bit of a coordination problem here, which yep. is, and it's also the fact that we've taken all the money out of the medical system, except in certain places. So in certain places, you can make a lot of money still. Mm-hmm. That's not the places where we, we want that to be all the time. And here we want to be in testing, let's say hypothetically. Yep. And we'd like somebody to be able to make either a lot of money testing or, or some way to get this the feedback yeah. loops correct. So you could overcome that a little bit. Do you have an idea of how we might mobilize either to get the FDA's hand a little less clenched around this to get uh to take advantage of the economies of scale that you and i both believe could would be enormous once this got started who are the players who might and paul you've got a lot of contacts people do listen to you so what what are you trying to do what could we do uh, i I think the administration has already signaled that the fda is willing to defer to the states if the state health department will take the lead on some of these questions so i think the next step is to persuade the governors to, that they have the freedom to create a different kind of regime for you know certifying tests and letting tests unfold. To think of to get the governors to think of themselves as the purchaser of these testing services, many of which they'll probably buy from their university uh, laboratories within state, maybe out of state, and um, uh, the, and to use the commitment of the funds together with the regulatory freedom to say to some of these laboratories with all of this expertise and all of this specialized equipment, if you can provide the tests, we'll pay you and you'll, you'll be able to cover the costs you incur to, to scale this, this activity up. I, I think this, this involves a commitment by the states to pay for a stream of testing services out into the future. In the middle of this depression, the state budgets have been hammered. True. So ideally, we have the federal government that borrows, they give money to the states, the states use that money to go purchase testing services. So let me suggest an alternative model, because that okay. does, that, I don't find that encouraging. Um, okay. Although a handful of governors would make a big difference, right? You don't need every governor right away to jump into action. A, a few could, a trial and error here is always good. Let some people try it, see what happens. If their states do better, people are going to say, hey, I want to try that. But don't, wouldn't it, the thing I notice here, mm-hmm. um, Rutgers, I'm sure there's some fine people there. Maybe they can produce 5,000 tests. We need yeah. 25 million, maybe 50 million. Actually, we need probably more than that because people are going to be tested often, early and often. So we need a, um, we need two things, it seems to me. A, 
producer of the tests and a reader of the tests. And uh, those people need to have some credibility, ideally, as a way to, to stamp yeah. you as clean for now. Um, to do that, I think you need a really large sum of money and a set of industrial level production folk, either in the pharmaceutical industry, testing industry, we got to get those folks mobilized. You know, I hate yeah. to say it because people yeah. are picking on them today, but you need an Elon Musk yeah. to grab this by the throat and say, we're going to make this work and get it done. Well, well let me give you my, my second kind of uh, piece of this strategy. So one piece is like these purchase commitments. There will be revenue that um, uh, if you scale up to be able to produce tests, there'll be revenue for you if you, if you do it. Another piece, though, is I've, I've said we should create a billion-dollar prize that the federal government will give to the first laboratory that shows that it can process 10 million tests a day. If they were competing for a billion dollars, I've talked to people in these labs, the, the, the molecular genomic stuff is actually pretty easy. They realize the problem they're going to face is the logistics. How do you get that many tubes in the door, yeah. open the tubes, get them, you know, so... And they're going to need to get services from, a, you know, an Amazon or a Musk or something. But, but they could hire that in. If they were competing for a billion-dollar prize, they would do it. And, and I think there's, there's no question in my mind that, that somebody would collect on that prize within, certainly within six months, maybe, um, maybe sooner. Maybe third. Well, I like, I like the Chico Marx line from uh, Night at the Opera when they ask – uh, I think Groucho asks him uh, if he can sail tomorrow, and Chico says, "If you pay me enough, I can sail yesterday." Yeah, exactly. It's the greatest, the greatest cinematic expression of incentives matter. Yeah. Uh, if it's a ten billion dollar prize, they might be able to do it in less than six months. It, yeah. it seems so. Here's my advice to you, Paul, and then we're going to move on to a different topic unless you have okay. something else to say. Uh, I hear. I think we need. Uh, I want uh, Fred Smith of FedEx um, yeah. or. Uh, Ryan Pearson of, I think it's Flexport, where mm -hmm. these are people who are really good at flying tubes around. Yep. So you need, you need a transport thing, and then you need uh, a lab to do the, the turnaround. Yep. And then you need a place that's producing the tubes and the swap, whatever it is, the cups, <laughs> the boilers, or whatever it is to do it yep. quickly. So I, I, I'd like to see you put together a ad hoc committee of extremely talented people who are a mix of logistics, production, science, and mobilize this. You, you got to convince them that this is not just like one other thing we need to be doing, but yep. might be the single best thing we could be doing. And I'm, yeah. I'm open to that myself, which is good, but I'm not, I don't belong on the committee. So anyway, I, I Actually, think let it's going to me, let me just say that um, I'm writing an op-ed. I've written an op-ed. I'm trying to shop around with, um, uh, Representative Don Beyer and uh, Representative Gonzalez, a Democrat and Republican from the House, uh, pushing this idea of big prizes. The prize for the big centralized lab is one. The prize for the device at home is another. I, I think we should use prizes as a way to motivate um, some big mobilized efforts to solve these problems. Well, the prize will get the um, talent to coalesce without a committee. So that be oh, okay. Uh, Let's move on. Let's move to a different topic, uh, if we might. Something sure. um, I think you've thought about. I know we've, everybody's think I'm thinking about it, which is um, what we might call globalization or free trade. Yeah. So a lot of very smart people right now are saying that, and and some not so smart people, I have to say, but a large group of people are saying, you know, this whole trade thing. Uh, this is a, this is the kind of thing you get, and they're right. Uh, a, a global world is more susceptible to a pandemic than a world of the Middle Ages. No. A global world is richer than the Middle Ages. You know, I like to say we've we tried by local. It's called the Middle Ages. It's not a world most of us want to live in. Yeah. Um, but I do think that this, the aftermath of this, however it ends going forward, wherever the next chapter is, is going to involve a conversation about our relationship with China as a trading partner. And maybe in other ways, I'm afraid to say, I think it will also, uh, you know, diplomatically, militarily, we're in for some dark times. But just for economically, just on the trade issue, yeah. um, how do you see the you're, – you're, I think, with me, a pretty much a free trader. Yeah. What's your response to this situation as a free trader? Yeah. So one of the first things is that uh, a lot of the problem we face with the spread of viruses right now – is just the fact that people want to move around. And it, unless we're willing to, you know, be kind of 
uh, draconian and limiting people's freedom to move around, we have to just face the, the fact that viruses are going to spread all over the world more quickly than they ever have before. I think there are benefits from letting people move around. And I think it's in principle, you know, problematic to say we're not going to let people do something they, they want to do. So um, I, I think uh, we just have to accept this. But, but this is part of why I'm so keen on trying to. Um, um, so uh, let me just start. Yeah, I hear you out there. Go ahead, see if you can. Um, so uh, <laughs> you I think it's really problematic. Those folks down. Yeah, it's problematic to try and uh, say that somehow somebody's going to decide that other people can't do things they want to do, like go see relatives, go see friends, go visit yeah. things. So this is part of why I think it's so important for us to invest in this testing infrastructure so that when somebody says in the future, oh, no, they've got SARS-CoV number three or number four, which is emerged in some other country, um, We'll say, well, we're ready for it. Uh, somebody's going to bring that into the United States, but we're already testing everybody every two weeks. As soon as somebody shows up, we'll find out where it is. We'll isolate them. You know, we're, we're, we're good to go. So I think of this investment in the testing infrastructure as, as a kind of like health defense that will protect us on a permanent basis from the, the spread of uh, viruses in, in the future. And they're going to spread. I don't think there's any way to uh, just pretend that isn't or that isn't going to happen or, to, or to, to wish it away. Well, I guess there is this issue of, you know, we talk about what people might have to do to, for me to trade with you, to take you as a patient as in, in my dentistry office or to yeah. serve you in my restaurant or to have you work in my nursing home. We might want to say we don't really want to trade with countries so much who um, have wet markets and really creepy animals. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I don't it, understand why China – yeah. has not responded to this by saying, forget whether whether they're culpable in any way for any of this yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in sinister ways, which I don't think we have any evidence for. Yeah. But it, I think it probably came from, at least we know other viruses have come from wet mark animals in China. It, yeah. So why don't we, wouldn't we want them to, wouldn't we encourage them to say, yeah. maybe not do that? I don't know. Sure. Or if you do want to do it because it's your culture or whatever, which I totally respect, don't be surprised if we don't want to, people don't want to buy your stuff. Yeah. Well, first, I, I think the Chinese have a pretty big incentive to get this under control. Yeah. Obviously, they may have some incentives to try and sweep under the rug, you know, mistakes or problems from the past. But I think they've got a big incentive to solve yeah. this. But, but even if we do decide that, you know, they're not doing a good job at that, what are we going to do? Um, I think buying the goods is really quite separate from the question of the mobility of the people. Fair and enough. Restricting the mobility of the people is going to infringe on the freedoms of people, uh, even U.S. citizens who want to go visit places, go see. Sure. So I, I, I don't think we can solve this by just saying we're not going to we're not going to have people interact with people from from China. Uh, well, but it, I don't know enough of the the medical side. Maybe you don't either. But if um, if we're at SARS CoV. 17. Yeah. Uh, right now, this is, we're in what? SARS CoV 2? 2. two. So, yeah. so, well, let's take three then. SARS CoV 3, the next coronavirus that is yep. scary and creepy and hurts people. Um, we're not going to immediately be able to test, right? We're going to have to start from scratch again, develop a new oh. test. No, but actually, this is this is where it really is pretty cool. They, they've they've made amazing progress in this okay. world of reading, you know, RNA strings. So they'll have all of this. It's just like all the hardware ready to go, and then somebody needs to just tell them, "Here's the RNA string for this new virus." Everybody just plugs it into their equipment, and boom, they're 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 ready to go. So we'll we could be ready to test at almost the drop of the hat as soon as we identify the new viral agent. And. Do you think there's um, – do you think – have you looked at all into the vaccine situation, or is it just so fraught with uncertainty? Yeah. Um, I haven't looked in detail, but, but I will tell you that um, even though I think the FDA should just back off, get out of the way on this testing you know, process and let the states run with this, I think the FDA actually has to be very careful about approving a, a vaccine because we have this very tenuous – consensus right now that it's okay for the government to require parents to vaccinate their children. 
And these children, these, these, these vaccinations for childhood diseases, these save just hundreds of millions of lives every year. Incredibly safe. We don't want to lose that consensus. It's true. We have another episode of like a, a vaccine with side effects that are unexpected that, you know, kill, kill some people. We could, we could, in this country at least, just lose the consensus for um, mandatory vaccination. So I think they've got to go, caref- go carefully on this. And that means it takes time to, to check all of that out. And so I think we just have to allow for the fact that, you know, it took, in many cases, it took five or 10 years to come up with a vaccine for um, some new disease. So we might get lucky, but, you know, we might not. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't cut any corners. I'm guardedly optimistic about that just because, again, I think there's an immense amount of human creativity being focused yeah. on that one thing, but it may not be solvable quickly. Yeah, no yeah way, we, no know, we, don't, we don't have an effective vaccine to control influenza. Right. No, it's, it's a lot. disease, but, you know, we've been yeah. working on that one. We don't have one for the cold. It's, you know, yeah. it's, you know it's, we've got a few successes, but a few failures. So. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's close and talk about uh, the labor market, which I think yeah. about a lot lately. There was a really – Beautiful piece uh, in the New York Times Sunday Magazine a few weeks ago uh, by Gabriel Hamilton. She's the chef and founder of a restaurant in New York yeah. called Prune. Yep. And she talked about just the reason I liked it. I liked it for a lot of reasons. It was beautifully written. I rec- recommend it to folks. We'll put a link up to it. But I think, you know, the other reason I liked it is it, it captured the human dimension of this, the dashing of dreams when a right. business, which happens all the time in capitalism, it's not just during pandemics, but a business that somebody – put their life into, put all their hopes, all their capital, all their emotional capital, and then it's over. It just happens. Competition comes along. In this case, it's a pandemic. Uh, But you think about the cascade of of effects. So, you know, the the busboys, the waiters, the waitresses, Mm -hmm. the suppliers, the truck driver, all the people who through a, um, uh, you know, the beautiful – tapestry of interactions that emerge out of buying and selling that are now cut. And so those people have to go reassemble into some other collection of, of yeah. employment. And of course, there's a lot of places that are booming, right? If you, if you can handle it, there, there are many, many jobs that are booming, but, mm. but they're very specific. They don't Im- usually involve the talents of, I'm talking about fulfilling orders, driving, delivering packages, mm. some wonderful yeah expansions going on, obviously, that are yeah. economic responses that you'd expect in a market system. But part of the challenge is, is that it's really hard to reallocate people, partly because we cushion the blow, which is a humanitarian thing through mm-hmm. unemployment insurance or through other forms of aid. Yeah. Do you have thoughts on what we can do to make that reassignment better yeah. as uh, and reassignment's the wrong word because it's not, nobody's doing the assigning. Re- reallocation, yeah. Reallocation. And, and I say that with the with the important side point, which I think is totally, I just don't know how this is going to play out, but it's possible people won't want to eat in restaurants for five years. I, I don't think yeah. that's true. I think we'll, yeah. we'll go back to quote normal quicker than most people think, but yeah. all the people who drive Uber, all the people who do these things that are really creative and wonderful yeah. are suddenly going to find themselves with nothing. And the question is, is that that reassignment is, uh, uh, let me say, frame it one more way. We put the economy in a, in a freezer, and we when we unthought, it's not like, well, oh, everybody go back to work now. No, they're not, because a lot of those places aren't going to work whether you allow them to go back or not. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think one of the strengths of the U.S. economy was that we had a system where people's jobs could just go away, but it was it was also a system where it was relatively easy to go get a new job. So those high rates of turnover, of job destruction, job, job creation, that was a good system to be in. The problem with the period right now is we've gotten a huge surge in job destruction and no offsetting huge surge in job creation. And this is what we run into in most recessions. We just have it in, in much bigger quantities than we've, we've ever faced before. So I think it's hard to know how to re- respond to this. I, I think one side of it is just to recognize that uh, – there's some ambivalence on the part of most voters about just cash transfers as a way to help other people. I think there's a lot more support for the idea that you can offer somebody something in exchange for work that they do. So I I think we should be looking at uh, things like, you know, possibly even the the civilian conservation corps that, that Roosevelt set up during the, the 1930s, 
which is, you know, not a particularly attractive job option, but at least it's something so that you can make sure that people aren't just destitute if they just run out of uh, other, other options. So I, I think we may end up thinking about these kind of like job creation kind of uh, government job creation uh, opportunities where the goal is not to make them permanent jobs, not necessarily to make them even particularly attractive jobs, but at least jobs that give people a bare minimum of security and, and dignity and, uh, and, and independence. Beyond that, I, I think the, the most important thing to do is just to stop the fear which is killing the restaurant business and killing my chance to go see my dentist. Uh, and there again, I think all we need is the information who's infectious right now. If we just knew who's infectious right now or who's infectious with the next pathogen in the future, we just had that information, we could make some small adjustments and get back to the economy that, that, that we had. So, you know, maybe some jobs like programs Maybe some continuing, you know, financial help to just people get people from keep people from going into bankruptcy, but as much as possible, just remove the fear and then let people go back to doing what we do, which is figure out ways to to work together and create value. My guest today has been Paul Romer. Paul, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Good, it's a pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.